Good evening. My name is Dr. Brian Henning. I'm professor of philosophy and of environmental studies at Gonzaga University, where I'm the founder and director of the Gonzaga Center for Climate, Society, and the Environment. And I'm so glad that you decided to join us tonight for our program. Informed by an abiding commitment to adjust society and care for the planet, the Center for Climate, Society, and the Environment serves Gonzaga University and the broader regional communities by promoting innovative and interdisciplinary scholarship, teaching, consulting, and capacity building on the climate, society, and the environment. We're really happy to host this event this evening. A quick uh, bit of Zoom etiquette before we begin. You'll notice that the closed captioning has been enabled. You can turn that feature on or off on your Zoom bar there as you choose. At present, only the moderator and the speaker can unmute themselves. There will be an opportunity to have a Q&A at the end, so be sure to write down your questions. Remember that at any time, you can change the view or orientation of your screen by going to the top right-hand corner of your Zoom window and changing to the view to the one that you most prefer. That allows you to select so that the slide is big and the speaker small or the speaker large and the, and the slide small as you choose. The chat is currently enabled and you're free to make use of it uh, to make comments to those assembled. However, should the chat become disruptive, I will change the settings so that it comments only go to the host. Beyond chat, a helpful way to share feedback during the talk is to use the reactions option at the bottom of your Zoom window. Feel free to give a thumbs up now in the reaction window to practice that. If that makes sense down at the reactions window, just click a thumbs up there if that is something you're able to do. Finally, our event this evening is being recorded and it will be shared via our YouTube channel within the next few days. So you can find it there. Consider subscribing to our YouTube channel to be notified of future events. If you're comfortable doing so, it's always nice to have some happy faces out there to present to. So if you're fe feeling comfortable with sharing your video tonight, I'd encourage you to do that as well. It's always nice for the speaker to have some, <laughs> some people out there that they're, that, they're that they're engaging with. I'd like to also bring your, to your attention uh, the many events that the Climate Center is hosting this semester, both in person and virtually. All of our events, including the one tonight, are recorded and posted on our YouTube channel. Um, again, you're encouraged to subscribe to that. In particular, I want to bring to your attention the third annual Spokane Candidates Climate Change Forum. It's going to be held uh, a week from Wednesday on October 6th at 6.30 p.m. At, here at Gonzaga University in the Cataldo Hall Globe Room. This year, the event will include uh, student moderators with a Gonzaga undergraduate asking some questions to Spokane City Council candidates and a local high school student asking questions to school board candidates. It's a wonderful event, especially in person. The audience is able to share their pleasure or displeasure by raising a green or a red card, respectively. It's a great opportunity to learn more about an important issue before, ba before our ballots arrive in our mailboxes in just a few weeks. I'd also like to begin by, uh, before introducing our speaker, to acknowledge the land on which uh, Gonzaga rests. In the spirit of the Jesuit practice of the composition of place, we're happy to acknowledge that Gonzaga University resides in the homelands of the Spokane tribal people. This land holds the cultural DNA and the spirit of the first peoples of this place, the people of the river. It is their ancestors who are here and bring forth the power of this place, the knowledge that comes from the land. We are grateful to be on this land and ask for its support as we work to manifest our intentions during this gathering of hearts, minds, and spirits. If you're joining us from somewhere else in the world and you want to acknowledge the indigenous people on whose land you reside, feel free to share that in the chat. And now it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker, Doug Howell. Doug has been a social and environmental advocate for 30 years. The majority of Doug's professional career has focused on environmental issues, primarily global warming. In the 1980s in Washington, DC, Doug worked for US Senator Barbara Mikulski, a Democrat from Maryland on environmental and other issues. In 1990, Doug worked for a law firm where his main client was the California Energy Commission. For the next nine years, he worked for the Environmental and Energy Study Institute where he created and directed their transportation and energy program. In 2000, Doug was hired by Seattle City Light to implement their first in the nation greenhouse gas, green, uh, greenhouse gas neutral program. And in 2004, he moved to King County to develop their climate protection program, including the first in the nation long-term greenhouse gas reduction targets and implementation plan. In 2007, 
He was hired to run the Northwest Regional Office for the National Wildlife Federation, where he managed staff, raised money, and set the pathway for the National Wildlife Federation's future direction in the Northwest. In 2009, he joined the Sierra Club to run their coal-free Northwest campaign. And in this capacity, Doug set the priorities, developed an implementation plan, and coordinated organizational field staff, Sierra Club departments, and external partners to make the Northwest the first coal-free region in the United States. Please use your Zoom reactions button to give a hearty zag welcome to Doug Howell, who will discuss the Northwest beyond coal, the fight to close coal strip. Doug, take it away. Hi, Brian, thank you so much. And uh, how is the screen? Are you seeing now the screen that we wanted to make sure came out? Yep, it's looking good on my end. Great. Great. Uh, well, uh, thank you so much. It, it's, it, it is a pleasure to be here. I'm joining you now from our nation's capital uh, in here for a visit with family and friends and some work uh, to be done. And uh, I'm really glad to take this time out. Brian and I talked about this for a long time. Very excited about it. I, uh, I have great affinity for the Spokane area. I, I love the physical nature of it, the, the river uh, running along the river and have done many, many walks there. And uh, I really love the people. There have been so many great volunteers, so many great organizations I've had the privilege of working with. It's really nice to be back. I, by the way, I was checking out some of you who are here tonight. I see a dear friend of mine, Ann Hedges, who is my partner in crime around the Coal Strip campaign based in Montana. And uh, perhaps we'll be able to hear from Ann tonight. I would welcome you, Ann, to chime in at, if this is at all technologically possible and has a profound wealth of knowledge of Coal Strip and will certainly have something to add to this. Um, I, I will shift now a little bit to uh, some more local stuff. Uh, I don't really need to go through my credentials. I, I guess I would want to say in summary that uh, I worked at all levels of government, at federal, regional, state, and local. I worked on all fossil fuels, coal, gas, and oil. I worked in all sectors, transportation, buildings, power, power plants, industrial development, uh, and all gases. Uh, and I, maybe I'll even share a story about sulfur hexafluoride, which was one of those mess ups you get from time to time. Um, I also want to do a shout out to Avista. Uh, uh, this is a part owner of Pole Strip. Um, I have been that what has taken me to Spokane so much. I've worked with a lot of the staff there. They have some really great staff. John Lyons runs the IRP and Clint Kalish, James Call, Scott Kinney. Really good people. Really enjoyed working with them. And even though, you know, we've locked horns from time to time and have been engaged in a number of lawsuits on Cold Strip, on um, Cold Strip and regulatory proceedings. Uh, great group there, and uh, no matter how intense we have to get, it's uh, really good to know that there's good people there. So I, I, I enjoy that. Um, tonight is about Pole Strip, but it's really about climate campaigns. What I wanted to do tonight, and I thought would be super helpful, is to treat Pole Strip as a case study. It's really interesting. It's so complicated. It's a, such a, an interesting case. So uh, I, I think we'll, we'll really learn from it and learn together about it. I will want to uh, kind of explain um, some of the basics about what we see as campaign planning, what I've learned over the years, and then use Coal Strip as an example. But I also want to stop and say um, just the importance of planning. Uh, climate is complicated. Climate is entrenched. And you really have to take the time to do planning to maximize your effectiveness. I've spent a lot of time on campuses. I love the actions that we all do and uh, keep doing them. And I would hope that out of tonight that you can take your actions and then move it a little bit more into the strategic planning realm so that you can ensure you're maximizing your effectiveness. Um, one other thing I really want to acknowledge is that these days, the work we do around climate, really the work we do around almost everything seems to be and is tied to social justice. Climate change is absolutely that way. We, we can't separate it anymore. The impacts are too profound. The inequity is too profound. And tonight, as I go through my slides, I'll be referring about how we can integrate that into planning it. And that is absolutely essential. So uh, with that, I think I will jump to our our first slide and just run through some basics about campaign planning, and how it lives in the fossil fuel world. So uh, with that, I'm gonna queue up. And, and Brian, if there's some glitch, would you, I will leave it to you to give me a heads up about that because otherwise I'm gonna stay focused on the PowerPoint. Does that work? Yep, absolutely. 
great. Okay, here we go. Uh, this is presumably, okay. So all of you know this, I was able to look over uh, the attendance and I know many of you, at least I know some of you and, and I know that this, some of this is gonna be fairly rote, but I also think it's very important to make sure that we're just setting context. So, um, and there's also uh, for me, something unique about the climate campaign. So first we talk about what fuels we talk, we, we're gonna focus on. There's coal, there's natural gas, not so natural gas, and there's oil. Um, with coal, you know, uh, in the in the realm of fossil fuel, our biggest culprit around climate, uh, really coal goes first. It, it, it is some of the dirtiest and usually the dirtiest. It is the easiest to replace. And it really makes sense that that's why we're seeing such a phase out of coal. There will be no coal in Washington state. There will be no coal power in Washington state as of the end of 2025. And it, what we suspected to be true that coal would go first, it's really turning out that way. Then we turn to natural gas. And, and this is really the emerging fight. And we'll talk about this tonight. It, it's a really, it's a growing fight, uh, not just here in Washington state, but in Montana. And man can speak to that uh, as you'll see with building building electrification going on is becoming a really big deal. And we still have, ironically enough, even though we're in the middle of phasing out fossil fuel in our electricity sector, both Avista and Puget Sound Energy are still gunning to build new gas. And so we still have lots of problems with natural gas, but I wanna mention two. Uh, we too often have thought of natural gas as cleaner. Well, with fracking and all the damage from that, the groundwater pollution, earthquakes, the land disruption, it's really much worse than we think. But um, there's another piece of it that's even more scary, and that is the upstream emissions. When you dig it out of the wellhead, you clean it up, you transport it thousands of miles sometimes, you store it underground, you redistribute it, you finally get it to your end use. And because natural gas is so much more powerful than carbon dioxide, if you lose, lose even up to 3%, in that life cycle chain of digging gas out of the ground and getting it to end use, it can be as bad as coal on life cycle emissions for greenhouse gases. And that that just that story is lost. And that's going to be really important going forward. And then the last, of course, is oil. That that may be the the uh, the last of the fossil fuels to go. The energy density is really hard to replace. It's so transportable, it's really different. So um but we're certainly on the pathway, and, and as we'll talk about tonight, uh, natural gas is one of those uh, fights that are, pardon the pun, heating up, okay? The other way to take a crack at it is which greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide, and industrial gases. So here's a quick story for you. I When I worked at Seattle City Light, one of the, and I was trying to map for the first time ever 20 years ago, this is before we really had scope one, scope two, and scope three emissions. Um, we were trying to map out all the uh, emissions profile and they had sulfur hexafluoride, which probably many of you know, at least it has been about 24,000 times more damaging than carbon dioxide on a pound for pound basis. And uh, so we were tracking it. There were dozens of these canisters with hundreds of pounds of sulfur hexafluoride unaccounted for just because it wasn't a big deal thousands, millions of pounds, thousands of tons floating around the whole infrastructure. Well, that was 20 plus years ago. Now, you know, we have much greater uh, systems for tracking SFX, but uh, sulfur hexafluoride. But, you know, these, this really, it, it tells you there's so many ways to slice and dice the climate campaigns. And sometimes you're doing them all at once, like a cap and trade, and we'll talk about that. But really just want to make sure that we understand the basics of how we slice and dice climate campaigns, because as we go forward, there will be many campaigns to solve the climate crisis. Okay, moving on, I'm gonna to go to the next slide. Okay, and the other way to slice and dice it, besides fuel and gas, is sector. And these line up, as you well know, bottom left, power plants, primarily coal and gas. Transportation, almost exclusively oil. Buildings top right, I believe that is a Spokane building. It's really gas, and that's where the big fight is. And then, of course, bottom right, we have ag and forestry, a lot of methane, CO2, about both how it's released from the soil or preserved or sequestered. I'm really going to be focusing primarily on electricity tonight and, and gas and coal. 
Okay. Oh yeah, there's one more piece I wanna do before I go on to the next slide. You know, when we do climate campaigns, we have been criticized for kind of overselling our ability to affect change. And let me give you an example. Um, economics, people will say that in the matter of Coal Strip is a perfect example. It was an environmentalist that helped bring this to closure and which now is expected at the end of 2025. It was really economics. Well, you know what? That's right. It was economics. And, but this, that's not in conflict. It's what our job is. It's our job to bring to light this great economic disequilibrium we have going on. As you all well know, we have these carbon externalities that are never incorporated like the price of carbon. But there's many other things, especially in the matter of coal plants. Let me give you one example. They are sitting on one of the worst Superfund sites in all of Montana at Coal Strip, Montana, the power plant, which if you remember the primer about this, this uh, lecture tonight, 17 million tons of carbon a year itself, when it's really at, at its maximum, that's equal to 3 million cars. That's always the top one, two, or three polluters in the entire American West. But it's not just the carbon impact. There's all these heavy metals and toxins that are from scraping the waste out of the flue stacks and the sludge in the boilers and putting it into these coal ash waste ponds, up to eight hundred acres of coal ash waste pond, which the Montana Attorney General referred to himself as a future Superfund site. The cost of cleaning this up is hundreds of millions of dollars. It may be a billion or more dollars. And that certainly has been the pathway of Superfund sites in Montana, much worse than we expected. This had been largely ignored, except for the good work of the broad coalition that worked on this, saying you cannot ignore the economic liabilities of this coal ash waste pond, in, in waste pond. And in fact, our legislature brought it up when Puget attempted to buy and retire one of the plants or part of the plants, but they got stopped in their tracks because they said, wait a second, you're gonna buy this plant, assume all that liability and then retire it. And so that, that bill died a hasty fate. But what happened after that, the next year then, the legislature said, whoa, 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 we want to know about this. And what came to pass from all that was really needing to have greater accountability for the, the coal ash waste. And now Puget Sound Energy themselves have set aside hundreds of millions of dollars in ratepayer funding to clean up for it. And we're, you know, and that, by the way, is going to become an issue for Avisi Utilities, while they're a much smaller owner the liability is hanging out there in the wings. So let's circle back. Yes, economics drives so much of our climate campaigns. It's our job to bring it to light. Okay, so let's go on. Okay, so now just getting back to some basics about climate. Um, this is actually an approximation of the Washington State greenhouse gas inventory, we have approximately 100 million metric tons of CO2 equivalent, that's your top left. We're gonna get rid of it all by 2045, 2050, thereabouts. It's gonna take many, many campaigns to get there. Uh, and when you get there, it's really important to be specific. So you can have these general goals, but let me give you an example. If you wanna get coal out of Washington, then here would be an example of something where you would need to be very specific. You want the Washington State Legislature by April 2019 to pass a law that says there will be no more allocation of coal and electricity rates by the end of 2025. That is the level of specificity you need to bring to your campaigns. And while we're going to do petition drives on campuses across Washington, that's great. Let's do it. But let's also be clear, what is that hook to? What is the goal? What is the numerical outcome? Who makes the decision by when? So I just want to lay that out there, how important that is, is to get anchored and centered in your campaign work. All right. So then let's go into a little bit more of some campaign basics, and then we'll shift back to full stream. So once you have a clear, time-bound goal, then you have to go through a series of questions. Know your decision makers. 
And in the matter of coal strip, as you're going to see, this was a horrifically complicated campaign. We had many decision makers. Sometimes it was dis, uh, Avista. Sometimes it was our state legislature. Sometimes it was the courts. Sometimes it was the Utilities and Transportation Commission, which is the regulatory body that oversees monopoly utilities in the state of Washington. But you must be very, very clear about what that is. So in the matter of the Clean Energy Transformation Act of 2019 that created the end of coal power in Washington state. Uh, we had to be clear of our decision makers, which is 51% of the Senate and 51% of the House. And so for you all, that would be Senator Billig, Representative Ormsby, Representative Pacelli. That would be your target. That would be your decision maker. So that's an example if you're using uh, the legislature. Okay, so what else? What specific decision do they have to make to give you what you want? Well, in this case, when we passed the Clean Energy Transformation Act, the no more coal provision was just one section of the bill. And for us, extremely important. 17 million tons are gonna to be reduced. That's probably still remains today the single greatest greenhouse gas reduction we may have ever achieved. There will be other long-term laws that may eclipse it, but right now it really stands as as the greatest climate reduction so far in the Northwest. So, so you better darn well be clear about who your target is and specifically what that you want. And the language we use was no allocation in rates because we can't control the destiny of Montana, but we can control what our customers pay for. And if we don't wanna pay for coal, then we have the ability to pass laws that say that, and then the economic pressure is going to translate back to Montana and lead to the closure of that plant. And that's why we focus so much on being clear about the specific decision that we're looking for. Okay, then you have to really ask, well, what is going to influence them? You all know better than I what's going to influence, you know, Billig and Ormsby and Richelli. And I, I actually am very reliant on you all to tell me that when we choose to use the legislature as our target. And, and you also have to know the, the pressures around there. And so I want to I want to talk a little bit about um, uh, some of the ways that we try to create pressure and influence, and that is so much of this has to do with the groups. Um, there is no going it alone in climate, and if we've learned anything over the past few years, our social justice partners are really really important. And so we've had a very very broad coalition for a long time. My my dear friend Anne can tell you much about that and. It's the broader the coalition, the better, because if you're, you, you can't do big things alone, even though I worked for the Sierra Club for 12 years, a huge organization, largest grassroots in Washington state, largest grassroots in the country, that's not enough. And so you have to look at your, your influence, social justice groups, tri tribes, local elected officials are incredibly important, businesses, customers, health professionals, energy experts, personal relationships, grassroots, you name it, you really got to think about that. And then we know to think about the type of pressures. Well, we talked about the economic pressures. There's another one, um, liabilities. And that's, that's another good example for the coal ash. Because if you have these lingering liabilities out there that can mean hundreds of millions of dollars for our utilities, you're gonna have your decision makers like your legislatures pay attention. So you really need to be clear about all these forces that, that come to play. And then, then you go into doing your plan. We're gonna talk about planning a little bit later and the resources. Um, you know, it, classically in, in the story of fossil fuel polluters and, and climate activists, it's a bit of a David Goliath. And as you all well know, uh, corporations are mostly the body of organized money and we're the body of organized people uh, that puts us in that kind of David role. And so we've got to be organized. We have a smart plan. And we still have to make sure that we have the resources to deliver. And, you know, we, we had eight lawsuits against the coal plant and the mine, uh, probably more to come. We've been in regulatory litigation, adjudications, uh, legislative negotiations. Um, and that takes resources. It's, it's not cheap. And so you got to know if you've got the plan that you're going to have the resources to get there. All right. So let's then, let's just do a little quick tour about so what's the coal landscape look like in the United States? And it really, it kicked off in earnest at the beginning of uh, the year 2000 there about. Um, and the first really started when it, around 2000, when Bush Cheney were in office, they were proposing over a hundred 
new coal plants across the country. And it was just, frankly, unfathomable. And the Sierra Club got really engaged in the Midwest, a number of states in Illinois, Indiana, Michigan, um, other states on trying to stop a lot of these new plants. And we quickly realized it's like, uh uh, you got to do it all. You got to stop every one of them. And I'm glad to report that of the 100 plus that were proposed, only about a handful, I think it was about five, maybe less, that actually got built. So that, that was incredibly successful. And so then the next thing you got to do, what we realized early on is that, you know, we can't just do uh, all the new, plant, the new plants, we've got to do existing plants. And so um, in 2000, there was about 589 boilers, and that was about 249 plants. And I'm glad to report that we are now have about 348 of those that are already retired or slated to retire. It has been a great success. It kind of proves the adage that coal goes first. And so, um, you know, it, it's really been one of our more successful stories on climate change, on fighting climate. So uh, let me go on then. What does that mean then for the Northwest? Well. The first plant that was being proposed, at least in Washington, was a uh, gasification plant you know, where they, they, gas, they heat up the coal so much it gasifies, they, carbon, they capture the carbon and they put it in the ground. Hugely expensive. It's, it's been a bit of a, you know, unicorns and pixie dust, and most of them have gone by the wayside because the economics don't pan out. Well, we stopped that in the early 2000s, and then we realized we had to move on to the next big fight, and that is, then what do we have to close? So here's the quick history on where we've been. Boardman is in Oregon, owned by Portland General and Idaho Power. Uh, that slated and closed in 2020. The decision was in 2009. It was largely a regulatory decision, broad-based effort as always. Then we had the Centralia coal plant. The first boiler went down in 2020. The second one goes down in 2025. That decision was made through the legislature in 2011. And then we have of the last of the big coal that comes into Washington is really from the coal strip Montana plant. It's owned by Avista, Puget Sound Energy, Portland General, Pacific Core, which for us in Washington is Pacific Power and South Central Washington. Northwestern Energy is Montana and then Talon. We'll get into this, the details, the gruesome details about how complicated this is in just a bit. Um, okay. In fact, we're gonna, we're gonna do it right now. And I'm gonna about to show you a slide that generally you never do this in PowerPoint because it's too complicated. So I'm gonna take a minute, just let you look at it. And then we're gonna walk through it line by line because you need to see the 10 year fight that Ann and I have and many, 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 many others have been engaged in. And so that you can really understand why the planning around this is so critical. So are you ready? Here we go. Okay. You never show a slide like this on PowerPoint. You know, it just, it makes people fall asleep. But we're going to work through it because it's really important for you to begin to understand the level of complication that we've been having to deal with. So let's do it line by line. There's four units. That makes it qualitatively different from Boardman, one unit, Transult in Washington, two, Colster at four. And you'll see in the second line, different ages, 75 and 76 versus the latter two, uh, 84 and 86. That puts them under different regulatory requirements because their age. Then you have different sizes. 350 megawatts for units one and two, 778 roughly. Don't get too hung up on these numbers. They move around a little bit almost always. But collectively, that's about 22,000, 2,200 megawatts. And just to give you a sense of scale, the city of Seattle is about 1,000 megawatts. So this one plant is more than twice the size of energy for a city like Seattle. So it is big. And as I said earlier, it was always number one, two, or three in the West of uh, point source pollution. Uh, so it's mammoth. So let's start to break it down. All right. So uh, the first owner you have there is Talon. This is the only independent power producer. They, they buy, they own the power. They mostly sell it wholesale to other utilities or industries. And they're the only independent power producer. The rest of these are utilities. And so if you continue on that, line, Northwestern Energy owns 30% of unit four. What a problem that could be. <laughs> then we go on to Puget Sound Energy. You can see 50% of one and two, 25% of uh, unit three, four. Drop down, Portland General, 20%, three and four, and Avista. Now we finally get to Avista, 
for just units three and four. But it's amazing how much of a difference they can make. And so, um, you know, Avista's, and I, I would say, you know, Avista's really, really ready to have pulse trip close, and certainly their analysis shows that. And while they might be a 15% owner, you cannot understand, understate the importance of their role in this campaign. And then you have Pacific Core, which is a completely different animal because they're a huge utility with 26 boilers across five states. And frankly, you know, I don't really think they care too much about closer. It's like, all right, you other owners, just go ahead, figure it out, and whatever, we'll go along. Uh, so you, that is not where our focus was. All right. So now I want to go back to uh, campaign strategies on this next slide. Okay. So let's say we have this very complicated coal plant and we want to start to make headway. And let's say, and this has certainly been true along the way, that Avista is one of our decision makers. And what we want them to do is to retire coal strip by 2025, December, 2025. And that's now in fact what the legislation does. So we do this thing called power mapping. Some people call it community mapping, influence mapping. And I'm gonna to start to put up some, some, uh, some entities up there and I want to let you know this is fluid. You should not get hung up on this because it is ever changing. In fact, that's why we, at least at Sierra Club, every six months we do planning because we have to know how the landscape has shifted. So let's just do kind of a thought exercise on what this might look like. So first we have the CEO, the CEO Dennis Vermillion. That used to be Scott Morrison. Really, frankly, much of the pull strip decisions were made during his tenure. And let's presume that he is the most influential. You'll see I have him right to center, uh, slightly in the opposed column. I'm not even so sure that's true. In fact, I'm pretty sure that Avista would just like the coal plant to go away. It's a huge liability and a wicked pain in the neck. So, you know, they, they may in fact be on the left side of that, but they don't want to stick their neck out too much because that becomes political problems for other reasons. So let's just, for thought purposes, presume your CEO is at the top as they should be. Then you might have your board of directors. Again, right of center, very influential. But this is fluid. And this is now why I want to show you how fluid it is. Let's say your target is instead of Avista, you have the Avista, you have the Utilities and Transportation Commission. They regulate monopoly utilities in Washington state to ensure customers don't get gouged. And in the matter of coal, that's in fact what's happening. So they can say is enough is enough. We're not gonna have our ratepayers overpay our customers. And if they come up with a directive, a mandate that is the full force and effect of law, well then, you know, who cares what the board of director thinks? They're clearly more influential. So I say that because this map I'm laying out for you can move around. Similarly, you might have the state legislature. What if they passed the Clean Energy Transformation Act of 2019? Well, lo and behold, they did. And it says no more coal by 2025. So again, in that circumstance, the state legislature is obviously more influential than the board of directors. So you need to know that these types of things are very, very fluid. Well, then what else do you have? You have community groups like, for example, Spokane Neighborhood Action Partnership. It's a great group, does low-income energy assistance, and they work very closely with Avista really important group to, to be engaged with. They do great work. Where are they on this spectrum? Are they slightly supportive? Well, they might be if they think it's overpriced, so you'd have to make that case. Maybe you have a local chapter of the NAACP in, in Spokane that because nationally the NAACP has been very engaged in coal because it's mostly black and brown people in low-income neighborhoods that have been suffering some of the worst health effects. And so they've taken this on as, as coal nationally. So where are they at locally in Spokane? So let's go on. Well, then maybe you have churches. Maybe your board is very, have you a bunch of very religious people on your board? Maybe Dennis Vermillion is very, very religious. We don't know. Do they have influence? We don't know. You have to find out. And let's say, for example, labor unions. Now, labor unions are not a monolith. They are very diverse. And so you can never really categorize, characterize labor unions as being in one area. But let's just say they're right of center, they might be fear of use, losing jobs, and those are the ones that you're gonna hear about. So maybe that's where they're located. And that's not really fair to put them near the bottom of the influential. And that's okay, because look where I put us. Oh, poor us. We're down there, bottom left, least influential, strongest support. And we gotta move everybody up into that upper left-hand corner. 
So, you know, it's okay. This is a moving map. It changes. And, but it's your job to know it. It's your job to keep reviewing it and know where you are and make sure you keep knowing which groups are most important. So I, I really think this stuff, though, it, it may be rote for some of you. I, I cannot understate how important this kind of stuff is. Okay. All right. Oh, one other thing I want to mention that's kind of unique about this campaign, and you'll see later that, you know, we, we really chose to focus on Puget Sound Energy first and Avista, and we did that really because we had the greatest political leverage over Puget Sound Energy and then Avista. But one of the tools that has been really primary in most of the coal campaigns is health impacts, because more often than not, the coal plants is located close to where the customers are, not so in the West generally, and certainly not true for coal strip. Big behemoth coal plant over 2000 megawatts, almost a thousand miles away. Uh, and and uh, so you really can't use health impacts for Avista customers for Puget Sound Energy. And, you know, good reason they didn't put it there. You know, your steam plant in downtown Spokane, I, I don't know how big that is. I don't, if I remember correctly, it's not that big. And I, I wouldn't want to venture to guess. But I can tell you, it's not 2,200 megawatts. And if it were, it would have been shut down a long time ago. So proximity matters. What arguments you can use like health matter. And that this is something that's very unique for us and that we really never were able to use the, the health card uh, as most of the coal campaigns were across the country. Hey, Doug, okay. you're doing, doing great. Just wanted to, you wanted me to give you a time check. You're about 25, 27 minutes and you're doing, so take your time, but. That's where you're Good at. to know. I really appreciate that, Brian. Then I, I will, um, I, this, the rest of this is going to go pretty quickly here. Okay. Then I, I want to go about plans. And in particular, there's some parts of this. Much of you know, uh, know this, you know, have you done your homework, your power mapping, are the right people there, especially social justice partners, really important to get them in upfront, part of the design, decision making, make sure the outcomes are there. Uh, and so that's really important. But you know, there's some basics here I wanna talk about and some of our, our most recent nomenclature we use, which there's been, you know, there's people have so many different interpretations. So I just wanna to try to clarify some of these definitions. Vision, that would be like the map of, you know, I have a vision of Washington state being completely fossil fuel free by 2045. In reality, it should be more than that, 100 million tons, but more specifically for coal strip, no more coal in the allocation of electricity by 2025. You need to be very, very specific. And here's the piece I wanna talk about. You've probably been hearing about this. Many of you talked about it. And we have this new nomenclature called theory of change versus strategies. And here's one of the things I really wanna talk about about theory of change. At first I didn't like it because well, we already have strategies. We have to do this. Theory of change is about talking about underlying conditions. Right, You can work on a campaign and get rid of a coal plant, but if you still have fundamental resistance about not acknowledging the deep, immediate, present threat of climate change, you're going to have keep having the same campaigns over and over again. So as you do your campaign, is there something you can do that gets to the underlying conditions that allows you to have a greater shift in the campaign you're currently working on? That is tough. But I invite you to hold that in your head as you're designing campaigns because it's very important. Then you go to your strategies. Okay, strategy is to have the state legislature pass no more coal by the end of 2019 legislative session and have that take effect by December 2025. That's your strategy. Then your tactics. This happens all the time. People jump to tactics without doing a vision, a goal, theory of change, strategies. They just start doing petitions or media campaigns, but you have to tie that to a bigger plan of how you're going to achieve your result. Um, then what people, when we do planning sessions, people want to know your roles. You really got to be clear about that. And then eventually it gets you down to the brass tacks. Who's doing what by when? And I, I really feel compelled now to do these type of just basics around planning because we miss it too often. And, and now, at Sierra Club, we used to do three months now, we're, I mean, six months now, we're doing every three months. And it drives you a little batty, but it's really important. I, I bet Anne could tell stories about, oh my God, Doug, you're doing planning again. Didn't we just do this? <laughs> yes, we did. And we're doing it again and again and again. Um, in fact, you know what's been happening? Many of the media and communication strategy groups, 
they're now doing a lot of strategic planning because they get hired to run, you know, advertising campaigns or do, you know, try to change branding and they do that. But then it doesn't necessarily exceed. They, they, they say, well, you know, we paid you all this money. It didn't work because it wasn't tied to a strategic plan. And so now we have so many of these communications and media groups that are becoming professionals in strategic planning because they don't want their work to be for naught. And it just really underscores the importance of planning. And I really encourage you to dig into that. Okay, so where are we now? Colstrip is a mess. Uh, they are finally, and this was inevitable, the owners are tied up in arbitration over the ownership contract. It's very, very messy. They've always asserted that no one owner has the ability to shut down the plant. That's largely true. Uh, and there's also litigation over the legislation in Montana, equally messy. Our utilities commission here, you know, doesn't really want to try to take a next step until they see what's going on with arbitration, and that's fair. Um, and here's the really interesting part of it. For all the non-Montana owners, and Montana owners are uh, Northwestern Energy in Montana and Talon Energy, Talon, Montana, more specifically, but Avista in Spokane, Puget in I-5 Quarter, Western, Western Washington, Portland General, of course, in Portland, Pacific Power all over the West, in there, um, they all now are expecting their ratepayers to stop uh, paying by coal by 2025, even though we do not have any kind of officially legally binding retirement of coal by 2025. It's going to be out of Washington, but it doesn't mean the plant will close. And here, here's the other, here's the real kicker. The strategic plans for all of these non-Montana utilities, they've determined that coastal right now is no longer economical, but you and I, are gonna keep paying for this plant through the end of December, 2025, because they are stuck in this catch 22 of not being able to be by themselves able to knock it, uh, really knock it out of business and send it to retirement. There is a possibility that our utility commission could say, all right, we've had enough. We're cutting off your funding now. No more ratepayers. They're not gonna pay anything else for full strip. And that enough might be to accelerate a closure before 2025, maybe not. But you know that they are in litigation is where they had to be. And so we know we have this end date with our legislative mandate about no more coal. And you know it's, it's clear that coal strip's gonna go away by then uh, and really it should happen soon. So that, that's the fate, the, the fate of the play uh, with coal strip. But I also wanna step back now because as I wrap up, I, I want you all to think about some things that you might be able to do. And just some of the things that are on the horizons, this is, this is not all of them. The Clean Energy Transformation Act is really the most powerful thing that we have in the matter of electricity. No more fossil fuel by 25, 80% carbon free by 2030, 2045, no more carbon, 2030, 80% carbon free, and 2025, no more coal. Uh, we are gonna be implementing this. We went through two years of rulemaking, but we're gonna be revisiting this uh, for years to come, critically important and anchor policy with work to be done. As many of you know, we just passed a cap and invest, a cap and trade. We're just beginning that implementation. And I just wanna raise for you a concern I have. This is wickedly complicated and we do not have the organizational backing of cap and invest like we had for the Clean Energy Transformation Act. I'm very concerned that industry is gonna be dominating this rule rulemaking and they may eat our lunch. And so we have to be very watchful about how this rulemaking goes forward around cap and invest. Um, then we had the straight state energy strategy recently. One of the big outcomes about that, and it looks at the full landscape of climate and energy in Washington is that we expect to see a really big movement around building and vehicle electrification. Electricity is really gonna be our primary way to be replace, replacing natural gas and oil. And that's that's, going to be evolving and really now the gas fights are heating up. Most notably around building electrification, I've only been learning a little bit about what's been going on in Spokane, sounds kind of funky and I'd love to hear more, but so you all may know it well in your own backyard, but it's happening all over the state. So building electrification is going to become a really big thing. And this one, this last one's under the radar. A Vista still wants to build a new gas plant by 2026. So does Puget Sound Energy. And that's just a real poke in the eye to what the Clean Energy Transformation Act is about. We really need to be phasing out fossil fuel. So I just wanted to make sure that, that was on your radar screen. And the last thing I wanna leave you with is 
you know, if you want to get involved, here's three really great groups that are in your area. 350 Spokane, Sierra Club, Washington State, the Energy Committee within Sierra Club is really most active on these issues we've been talking about. And many of you know the Sunrise, it's mostly largely a uh, younger uh, group of people driving a lot of students. Uh, you can see their URL. It was too complicated there. So I would just recommend Googling uh, Sunrise Movement in Washington State. So uh, that wraps me up. Brian, how what should I do a stop share on this? Yes, yes, that would be perfect, Doug. Thank you so much. Thanks for sharing your thoughts on these uh, really diverse and important top topics. One of the reasons we created the Climate Center was to host you know, educational events to facilitate these sorts of discussions. and. And your talk is a great example of, of that mission in action. So with the time remaining, uh, and we have quite a bit, we have a, a good half an hour here. Um, there are a couple ways that for everybody to participate, to make it uh, so that we've got 72 people. So we need to be organized here. I'm gonna put in the chat three ways in which to participate. The first is to post uh, something in the chat, and then I will do my best to field those questions to Doug. A second option is to send me a direct message. If you don't want to, if you're a little bit shy, you can send me a direct message in the chat. Just uh, select to have it sent directly to the host. And the third option is if you go to reactions at the bottom and you select raise your hand, it'll raise your digital hand and that'll create a queue for me. And then I can call on you and invite you to unmute yourself one at a time to ask a question to Doug. So while you all are collecting your thoughts, I'd like to start with the first question, if I may, uh, because part of the reason that I invited uh, Doug to, to join us when, I, um, you know, when we founded the Climate Center uh, is actually a conversation I had with a colleague uh, who said something like this. He said, you know, activism is uh, ultimately ineffective, that it's all heat and no light, that in fact, an activists have never achieved anything of significance. Any significant policy um, uh, achievement has been um, because of other things that rallies, marches, um, make for good photos, uh, but they don't actually achieve anything. It seems to me that part of the question is a causality question, right? How do you prove that X caused Y? Um, so to make it more specific, we could say, is it false to claim that climate activists uh, played a significant role in the closing of these 348 coal boilers um, or the Centralia One or pick your example. So um, I'm not sure if that question makes sense, but uh, what, um, what do you make of it? Well, I, I would say it's, it's uh, I don't think it has ever been solely environmentalist. It most certainly has never been solely Sierra Club and often our job has been to be uh, behind the scenes and promoting the local efforts. So much of it for the the uh, all those boilers across the country, it's been health impacts and it's been low income and BIPOC communities who have really been suffering the direct, direct impacts and have them be the face of the campaign. And so um, health professionals have been hugely important in these fights, NAACP and depending on which district you're in has really been really important. And so have we ever, have we collectively uh, being able to make a difference? Yes, I would think so. And I'll go back to that example I, I talked about, about the coal ash ponds. This is a billion dollar liability. And some would say, and we would say that economics drove the retirement of coal strip. And that's true. But we have brought to light some of these economic liabilities that otherwise would have been ignored. And they're so big and so potentially damaging for you all, the customers and ratepayers, that our legislature stepped in and said that we have to do something about it. And the result of it was, is that Puget Sound Energy has set aside hundreds of millions of dollars of our money to pay for this cleanup. And I do not believe that would have ever happened unless we were active. So that's one example, but I believe that example has played out dozens, hundreds of times across the country. Thanks, that's a good start. So we've got a question from Larry. I'm gonna invite you, Larry, to unmute yourself if you'd like. I've done that. Thank you. Um, Doug, I, I really appreciated your, your presentation. Uh, during your presentation, uh, one of the people in chat uh, pulled up a pie chart that I've seen several times from Avista, uh, where they tell you what portion of their electricity is made by different energy sources. Uh, I keep asking what portion of their business portfolio 
is fossil fuels. And I don't know, I can't get the answer to that. And I wondered if you had any idea because they, they sell not just electricity, we're not interested just in how much natural gas uh, that they burn creates electricity, but they are selling people natural gas to heat up their homes and heat up buildings. And I, I think they're hiding how dependent they are on natural gas in their business plan. And I, I'd like to hear what you have to say about that. Let me, uh, thanks. And is it Larry or Lawrence? Larry. Thanks, Larry. Uh, two pieces on that. The electricity side, really what you want to go to is the state fuel mix report, which is the annual report that electric utilities have to report to our State Department of Commerce to give the profile of the electricity sources for their entire portfolio for electricity. They break that down by greenhouse gases and the number of megawatts. So the first place you want to go, if you want to see the balance of coal and gas and electricity, uh, you you got to you really should go to the safe fuel mix report because that is the the as close as we get to a definitive source about the electricity mix for all of our utilities. On the building side, um, I, I don't know enough about what um, Avista has said about the profile of natural gas in their buildings. They are both a electric and gas utility. Uh, I've been hearing that they feel tremendously uh, resistant to acknowledging that gas has got to go away and fast. And the first order of business is to not allow new hookups of gas anywhere in their service territory, and then begin the systematic transition of gas out of buildings, right? Um, and, uh, you know, we have two primary sources of power for our buildings. We have electricity and gas for the heating realm. Uh, I really could not tell you, Larry, what the portion is of gas for their building sector. Uh, and I can't speak to that because I have mostly lived with Avista in the electricity realm. But I suspect that that would be readily available just as the state fuel mix report is for electricity. Thanks, Larry. Uh, we have a question from Greg Finley. I think it's a Slash, uh, yeah, so he says, thanks, Doug. I'd like to also hear from Anne. Northwest Energy was trying to keep coal strip three and four open until 2042. Uh, what is their latest plans? What is, or what is the latest with their plans? I'm not sure if, Anne, uh, I'm not sure if you have just gonna, feel free if you'd like to unmute yourself. I feel bad about calling on you, but I'm a professor, so I guess I'll just do that. <laughs> the Socratic method. Um, I'm happy to answer that question. Um, Northwestern is doing everything it can to continue to operate the plant. Northwestern bought into the plant later than everybody else. It didn't get involved in the plant until 2042, uh, sorry, 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 until 2008. And so they have a really dep different depreciation schedule than all the other utilities who have been there from the very, since the very beginning, other than Talon, which is a little more complicated. But Northwestern Energy was able to hoodwink our commission into, um, charging customers an enormous sum of money for its 30% share, it's 220 megawatts of the plant. And that $400 million at about a 10% rate of return um, is going to carry them through 2042. And if that plant no longer operates, they won't, they won't necessarily get paid all of that money. And we're still at, I think it's close to $300 million that customers have to pay off on that um, on that share of the plant. So Northwestern is desperate to continue to have that revenue stream coming in. And so they've done everything they can think of, including continuing to go to the legislature year after year after year and force to continue to operation of the plant, force customers to pay for the, um, the remaining share as long as they want, whether the plant operates or not. We beat back all of those proposals in the legislature, but they did manage to pass a couple bills this session that um, Doug referenced that sent all of them, all of the owners to the courtroom uh, to try to figure out if the other owners, you know, if majority rules, if super majority rules, or if one owner can hold everybody else hostage. Um, and that is the, the question that has been de being decided in a couple different courtrooms across the West. And, 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 and thank I, you. Before, before you jump in, Doug, I, I forgot to ask you to um, introduce yourself, Anne. I'm sorry. I'm Ann Hedges with the Montana Environmental Information Center. She, her. Thanks, Ann. 
And and thank you. And and just so people know, um, and and in this way, sometimes I, I really uh, can have some empathy for uh, a Vista for what a tough place they're in, because they have a, a partner in in uh, Northwestern Energy that's just so entrenched. So just to just so you understand the level of how nefarious this is, they bought the plant in 2007 for approximately 187 million dollars. They were able to convince their utility commission one year later that they bought that with shareholder money, their, their, uh, their owners, they bought that plant in 2007. They were able to convince their commission a year later to sell it from 187 million to something like $412 million. A humongous markup that was almost entirely profit. And they will do anything they can to keep that gravy train coming. So just so you can understand, this is just one level of the complication that Ann and I have been dealing with for 10 years. So I'm gonna take one more question from a direct message and then take Carly's uh, hand, if that's okay, Carly. Um, so the uh, person asks, is there any inequality involved resulting from the environmental impact of the coal strip mine specifically? Absolutely. And again, Anne can speak to this. Um, you know, the, some of our uh, important allies out in Coal Strip have been ranchers and tribes. Uh, they've been, you know, their biggest concern is the, the poisoning of the groundwater uh, because you live and die on water in, in very dry eastern Montana, where sometimes they're only getting like 15 inches of rain a year. And so their aquifer is gold and uh, it's being poisoned. Um, you have 800 acres of coal ash waste pond and they're leaching. And now underground, those toxins have leached almost twice the size. And uh, so there will be some really unfair impacts to tribes and ranchers for the water quality. Uh, and so, yes, that's very, very real. And uh, that's why we really worked hard to try to get some transition funding for the community. Puget has put in 10 million for the community. Avista has put in 3 million. And it's only because the work that we did in Washington that we were able to get this funding from two out of the six owners to start to address some of these inequities. I remember going to Utilities and Transportation Commission um, hearing here in Spokane a few years ago and several members of the, I think it was the Cheyenne and some several other ratepayers in, in Montana made the trip to Spokane. And there were actual uh, local Spokane uh, people testifying that, that they shouldn't be allowed to speak. Uh, that people from Montana should, should, you know, should not be allowed to, to uh, weigh in on a hearing uh, that the Washington Utilities and Transportation Commission, I use this as an example in class about <laughs> environmental justice issues, right? We're happy to get the electricity, but we want them to be quiet about, um, you know, the, the environmental concerns in Montana. And, and so it's a, yeah, it's an interesting, difficult problem. Uh, Carly, would, did you have a, a question? Yeah. Thank you, Doug, for all your information. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about uh, resource adequacy in the Northwest um, with the new laws coming in to phase out coal and other fossil fuels. Uh, I know that there's going to be a struggle to meet energy demand. And um, if you know anything about Avista's plan to meet uh, demand once coal is gone, um, and then generally in the Northwest, your thoughts on um, resource adequacy and uh, how we're going to continue to meet uh, demands while going 100% carbon free. It's a, it's a very legitimate concern. I think uh, some of that has been taken uh, out of context. Uh, we had a, a very big study that was commissioned by all the utilities during 2019 in the debate over the Clean Energy Transformation Act. Resource adequacy was one of the biggest deals. And you know what was really missed in the study is that they had to do some prognosticating about the future, but relying on, on current technology and price. And, and that, that is just fundamentally flawed because what we know is that what has been the trend with wind and solar in particular is the cost has continued to plummet. We expect that with batteries. And so when you're prognosticating out 20 years, but you're only relying on existing price and, and technology, you're not gonna have a complete picture. And so uh, there's just been some of that, but it is going to be a concern. It's really going to be a much bigger concern, at least in the studies that say, in, as you really pinch out the last bit of gas, 
uh, because you know the the idea is that the thinking is it really provides a tremendous amount of flexibility. Well, we have to start building that in now, and there's so much we can do, starting with most importantly on the efficiency side to reduce the amount of electricity that we use in the first place so that we have much less to replace. But it is a very legitimate concern. It's gonna be complicated. It certainly is doable. And um, it, it, it's, it's worth, it is important to give it attention, but I would, I would be careful in how you see the studies and make sure you really understand the context within which uh, the problem about resource adequacy is being presented. Yeah, thank you. Um, I actually work as a consultant in the utility industry and um, we're helping to build the Northwest Resource Adequacy Program. Um, and so I just was curious what your thoughts were. And um, yeah, I think you're definitely right. <laughs> and I, I see here in the chat, um, Jim Lazar is really one of our authorities. Hi, Jim, nice to see you. Uh, thank you for joining tonight. Uh, Jim is really a bit of a, an authority on uh, many things. He's one of our leading energy economists in the Northwest. Uh, uh, he has a national reputation, and, and Jim knows the the resource adequacy issue better than I. And Jim, if and if Brian, if it's okay, I would invite Jim to take a crack at that one too. Uh, thanks, thanks, Doug, and it's great to see you. Uh, the resource adequacy challenge is 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 definitely going to be an issue for the next decade as we phase coal down and phase gas down. Uh, as Doug mentioned, both PSC and Avista are planning to build new uh, natural gas power plants to meet their capacity needs. The good news, however, is that the cost of, of storage, battery storage in particular, is coming down so quickly uh, with new technology. The, you can look up ORM Energy. I'll put a link in the chat in a minute. Uh, a, a company that Bill Gates and Warren Buffett are investors in has announced a battery technology that costs 10 per, one tenth of what current uh, utility scale batteries cost. Uh, it's only one of many new storage technologies. Storage is one way to meet resource adequacy. Resource adequacy means the capacity to meet customers' needs at any particular moment in time. And wind. Uh, isn't a perfect tool for that because sometimes the wind doesn't blow. In fact, the wind behind me isn't blowing, as you can see. Uh, and solar works great during the daytime, but not so well uh, at night. And, but uh, I think that uh, the Northwest is blessed with a huge amount of hydropower. Uh, Avista has uh, Noxon Rapids and Cabinet Gorge, two very large dams on its system, plus the Spokane River complex. Uh, and the combination of battery storage plus hydro is going to, I think, allow the Northwest to meet our resource adequacy challenges uh, much more easily than much of the rest of the country. We can make wind power when the wind is blowing, solar power when the sun is shining, and then use so, uh, hydro and storage during the intervening hours. Uh, we actually have enough hydro to meet our entire regional peak demand all by itself. But if we ran it too, for too many hours, we'd run out of water. So we need the wind and storage to provide uh, supplements to the hydro system, but the hydro system will be our, our main source of capacity for resource adequacy. Thanks. Thank you, Jim. And, and Brian, I really appreciate you uh, allowing me and, and you to call on Ann and Jim. And there's probably so many other people that are, that are here with us tonight that could be equally part of discussing uh, the answers to these questions. And that's really the point, you know, to take on these big things, it has to be a very broad collaboration. And so many people on this, uh, this seminar tonight have been part of this working solution. So I'm glad that we get to hear from some of them. And that's really the only effective way to operate is to be as inclusive as possible. You know, uh, Brian, I, I have a question. I wanna do a time check, but I did see a question in the chat that caught my attention and I'm wondering if you would allow me to uh, speak to that question I saw in the chat. I was uh, just about to right. ask Ann, Ann Claire's, uh, Mitchell's question about biomethane. Is that the one you were going to field? Actually, it's a little bit off topic. It's totally related to electricity, but uh, it isn't about coal strip. It was about the lower Snake River dams. Oh, okay. Um, 
let's, if it's okay, because we've got another 10 minutes, I'd like to take, because Ann Claire's question came came first, I promised to get to the to the lower sneak as well, because a lot of people are, are concerned about that. So Ann Claire asks, in the push to electrify and phase out natural gas, is there a discussion surrounding biomethane and related incentives? Uh, and Jim, you know, commented a, a little bit on that, and she clarifies, um, my question more concerned the potential for new biomethane infrastructure and incentives to arise if natural gas infrastructure is being phased out. So part of the debate, as I take it, is some would say we need to phase out natural gas entirely. Others would say, no, let's use the infrastructure we've got and pump it full of biomethane in, in, instead. Um, so it, since it's heating up, where do you see biomethane fitting? Well, let's let's first define it. Um, when, when the state has studied it, when we're talking about biomethane, I presume we're talking about renewable natural gas. And in the state study, really what they looked at was uh, landfills, um, uh, biodigesters, uh, wastewater plants. Um, and, and what the state study found was that with really some very, very strong economic incentives, um, you would be lucky if you could get of uh, what we have now for existing natural gas feedstocks with really strong incentives, you might only get three to 5% of the necessary replacement value with really, really strong incentives uh, for, those, for those sources of renewable natural gas. Uh, that's not a solution. And my concern is what I see with the utilities is that I see that being taken out of context and they will want to justify the existence and prolonging of existing gas plants and even investing in new ones on this hope for promise that we will have sufficient feedstocks for renewable natural gas to justify these new investments. We won't. Even if we did, it wouldn't justify a new investment in a plant. And that match that renewable natural gas, to the extent it exists, may well better be used in other purposes like transportation. So my take is on the renewable natural gas, it is being way oversold, uh, really to very damaging effect. I think Jim's point about 5% is a significant one. If that... All right, so I think that Dave Randall, um, I'm not sure if you wanted to unmute yourself and ask, but I, your question's pretty straightforward. Um, you know, where, where does Doug stand or where does this discussion with respect to electrification, you know, do we, you know, given that Jim's point about, about hydro, you know, do we remove the lower snake dams or would you be in favor uh, of that given uh, what Jim had just said? Well, the, it's very complicated. I just want to speak to one piece of it. Uh, but first of all, I want to say, yes, we can replace that energy. It's about a thousand average megawatts. Yes, we can replace it. So I'm not really worried about being able to replace the energy, but I just want to give people a way to think about it because I don't think they've gone through the thought process around climate impacts and that the reason we want to stop climate change is the horrific impacts. And, and one of those areas where we have really horrific impacts is on salmon. When I was at the National Wildlife Federation 15 years ago, we did a study and salmon was having eight different climate impacts that was already stressing out a very stressed out species, a number of species. And, um, and, and really, so people would then say to me when I joined National Wildlife Federation, why would you wanna take out a thousand megawatts of clean energy? And that's because people are, people need to shift when they think about the Lower Snake River Dam as it being a, a climate problem that we take it out to being a climate solution. We want to stop climate change because of the horrific impacts. And when there was a study done years ago about one of the few remaining strongholds in the entire Pacific West, Northwest, that might be able to save salmon in a changing climate environment, it is the Lower Snake River dams that can be removed, that can have a transformational effect to preserve our salmon for decades to come. And so really you need to think about not taking out that thousand megawatts, which can be replaced. replaced. Don't think about it as a climate problem. It is a climate solution to save an endangered and endeared species for the Northwest. Dave, would you, um, I'm not sure if you want it, it looks like you might wanted to uh, jump in. Feel free, Dave, to unmute yourself if you'd like. Nope, you're good? Okay, thanks, Dave. Good to see you. Uh, so I think we've got time for one more question. I don't see anything else in the, in the chat, so I'm gonna pose one that came up in my environmental ethics class the other day, Doug. Um, 
So we were discussing Sierra Club and you know its long and respected history uh, in in America, doing tons of, of great work, but you know some have pointed out also that it, it hasn't always lived up to its mission in terms of justice and, and equity concerns. So I'm curious because you've got a long experience with them, but other environmental organizations, um, it feels like a, there's a new moment right now in the climate justice movement that is changing the profile of environmentalism uh, in the United States and maybe worldwide, this focus on intersectionality and, and marrying uh, justice concerns and environmental concerns and climate concerns together. So I, I wonder if you just invite you to, to talk about whether you would agree with that and, and how you have experienced it and see it moving forward in the future. All right, I, thank you, Brian. That's a great question and really critical. I wanna do two pieces on that. You know, uh, Sierra Club went through its own history, John, creating the parks and, uh, you know, really did a fabulous thing. And so we really wanted to revisit that history and talk about it. And it was very upsetting for many at the Sierra Club. Why are you doing it? Why are you targeting that? And, and one of the perspectives I really got that I really appreciated is that if we can't acknowledge our history, we are limiting our ability to understand now the behaviors we have that may be untenable in 10, 20, 30, 40 years from now. So our ability to be open and understand how our behaviors may be limiting us right now is really linked to our willingness to revise and look at the honest history of our past. So I embrace John Muir for what he's done. We also have to acknowledge the horrible attitudes that were a product of his time. And we do that so we can empower ourselves to do the same as we have to be obligated to the future and know that what we're doing now may not be sufficient. So that's one, that's one piece. The other piece is that the meltdown we had around our, our cap and invest legislation. Uh, you know, we were a divided community and the, the social justice community in particular had a tremendous problem with it. And it was terribly divisive. And I, what that really, one for me, part of why that occurred is that you've got to bring in our social justice partner, uh, partners, low income advocates, BIPOC communities, at the beginning of any major effort that you do and really hear and make them part of the planning and, 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 and the intended outcomes for what you're gonna achieve. Unless and until we do that systematically, we're gonna to continue to run into these really divisive policies that really tear up our communities. And if we're gonna win, we gotta to hang together over a very broad coalition. Thank you so much, Doug. I think that's a wonderful place to end. Uh, maybe you could all join me in, in using your reaction button to thank Doug for the facilitating and, and creating this uh, great discussion tonight. Um, the talk will uh, has been recorded. I'm posting in the chat uh, where you can find the, um, the link to our YouTube channel. I encourage you to subscribe to that. You can also go to uh, gonzaga.edu slash climate center events and uh, see our, our future events there as well. Uh, this is a really great uh, example of the sorts of, of projects that we hope to sponsor on an ongoing basis. I hope that a lot of you are able to consider attending our event on uh, a week from Wednesday, the Gonzaga's uh, uh, co-hosting the Spokane Candidates Climate Change Forum again this year. This is the third annual event. And uh, for those of you who are in Spokane, I really hope that you'll consider joining us in person for uh, a really great event. Uh, thank you again, Doug and Ann and Jim and Carly and everybody else who, who uh, contributed to uh, making this a great conversation. Thank you, everybody. Take care. Thank you.